right? So I love, and it's going to sound terrible, I love when people <laughs> call me and they're suffering, right? Because inside I'm going, yes, I can help these people. Right. We've got them now. 99% of the time, your relationship problems are not a me or a you issue, especially not a you issue, right? They're actually an us issue. It's a system that we're both creating together, not because either of us are bad, but because both of us end up feeling really hurt and threatened when we can't connect with each other. And both of us make things worse the way we try and get back to connection. What are the strategies? They're not productive. So let, let's just say 80% of the time, here's the most common dynamic. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves podcast. Today, I have Fiacra Figs O'Sullivan, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist who's certified in EFT, emotionally focused therapy. And he is the founder of Empathy, spelled with an I at the end. So welcome, Figs. Uh, thank you, Mark, for having me on your show. Honored to be here. Oh my gosh. And that you come with an Irish accent is truly so good for my soul, having grown up with an Irish mother. So I feel like uh, uh, I always just resonate. I, it feels like home when I'm around people who speak with an Irish accent. Oh, well, that that that's good to know. As long as you're not going to feel you're at risk of being scolded at any moment <laughs> by an Irish mother. Right. I think I've hopefully worked through that. But if I have her on the podcast, I might get reactive. Who knows about exactly. that? Exactly. But man, yeah, the I also find that there's a poetic nature to the uh, intonation and, and pace of the Irish accent, which is really nice. Right. Yeah. Well, we cannot help. In general, it's a big generalization. Irish people love to tell stories, whether you want them to or not. Right. Well, I like that because story is how we learn. And you really master a specific area. I know you, you really are very focused on couples, helping couples make it work, giving them sort of like the secret sauce to help navigate them out of or through, I, maybe is a better term. What I find people come to so often and we haven't really had a lot of guests on the podcast to discuss this, so I'm really excited to chat with you today, is this intersection that I think we all get to probably many times in our lives, which is like, we're at a crossroads. I don't know that I want to be in this anymore, or uh, I don't know my way out, or we don't know our way out. And how do we even go through that? Like, I know you call it the waltz of pain, which mm -hmm. I really... I, I both love the term and resonate with the painful nature of that dance. Right. So, yeah, when couples come to you in that scenario, sort of what is the circumstance? Where are they at? Like maybe you could give yeah. us a little pathology on that. Yeah, well, it was a great, great question. So all couple, 99% of the couples that come to see me, they come to see me because they're in suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, rarely do I have someone reach out to me because they were inspired you know, they had a like, you know, <laughs> yeah. inspiring dream and they're like, I just want to get better at loving. Right. Um, and weirdly, and this may sound weird. It's actually easier for me to help the couple or the individual that's in suffering than the person that I feel inspired to be a better person. Right. Because, you know, yes. the way like most people won't do the work unless the pain of staying where they are is just so great that it's such a motivator to that change something, right? So I love, and it's going to sound terrible, I love when people <laughs> call me and they're suffering, right? Because inside I'm going, yes, I can help these people. Right, right. we've so, got them now. Exactly. Yeah. So, and look, suffering, you could just, like, there's loads of different variations of the context of other suffering, but their one common, you know, thread is that they can't find a way into connection with each other. They're both experiencing each other as withholding a flavor of love from each other. And it really hurts. Mm. And the more they both try and the way they're trying makes logical sense to get their partner to stop withholding that flavor of love from them, the worse they make it. So people end up tying themselves in knots. They make their disconnection worse by the way they try and get out of it. So is the perception, like when you say we're both withholding a part of ourselves or maybe multiple parts of ourselves in that dance and maybe, and maybe explore what you think about that language. And then 
And when we're in that state, do we self perceive as that? Or are we only thinking the partner is the one that's withholding? Like, do we see ourselves as like, I'm the one who's got my poop in a group. I They're the problem. They're not being vulnerable. They're not sharing. They're doing too much stuff with the guys or the girls or whatever it is. Yeah, most of the time, of course, there's exceptions to this, right? But most of the time, two people come to see me, let's say as a couple, and one of them tells me, even if they don't think this is what they said, they tell me all the things that are wrong <laughs> with their partner and spouse and how if they got their act together, then the relationship would be better. And the other person, even if, they, if they've learned how to communicate well, they go, oh, I'm going to take that in. Thank you. And then they give their version of, well, actually, let me tell you about how the other person doesn't have their act together. And if they made <laughs> some changes, everything would be better. Now, here's the funny thing. They're both right. But they're both wrong because they only have 50%. They both have 50% of the truth, right? And 50% of the truth is wrong. So in a way, you could think of what my role is. I integrate both of their perceptions, both of their experience of the pain of the disconnection. And then I present it to them as one shared narrative of the system that they're both creating together. The relationship problems are almost never, and a lot of your listeners and viewers are about to turn off right now, 99% of the time, your relationship problems are not a me or a you issue, especially not a you issue, right? They're actually an us issue. It's a system that we're both creating together, not because either of us are bad, but because both of us end up feeling really hurt and threatened when we can't connect with each other. And both of us make things worse the way we try and get back to connection. What is the strategies or what are the strategies that we usually use that you're saying they're not productive? Like we're going from you're withholding, so I'm going to engage in this behavior. So what yeah. are the ones that you see the most that are really actually the intention? It sounds like you're saying the intention is positive. It's like Absolutely. show that part of yourself you're not showing and I'm going to do it by yelling or criticizing or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So what is it like? Well, there you go. You just name. So. So let, let's just say 80% of the time, here's the most common dynamic. And there's slight variations of this, right? Yeah. But 80% of the time, one person is hurting inside, feeling I'm not loved, I'm not prioritized, some flavor of I really want to be closer, I try, but the other person's not trying that well, right? And so they're hurting, feeling alone, and they rise up in the strategy explicitly or implicitly, consciously or unconsciously, and then they give feedback, they criticize, they add value for the other person, right? Like, you know, the, but this is always, they, they try and get the other person to change. They protest yeah. the disconnection by asking the other person to change. And let's say, obviously, yelling, literally shouting at them, calling them names would be the, like, you know, would be the really explicit criticism but also let's say someone has done like years of personal development work and, and they know how to communicate with nonviolent communication remember the other person's organism is millions of years old even if you <laughs> dress up i have some ideas of how you could be a better human being in this relationship their organism <laughs> can smell it out right they can sniff i'm being told i'm bad from a million miles away so even if you dress it up hey I'm going to use my amazing conscious skills right now and invite <laughs> you to be a better partner. It's not going to work because their organism is definitely going to get threatened. And by the way, for a good reason that you should be happy about, they're getting threatened because they love you and they know you're giving them this feedback or this incredible value that you have to offer. Right. They know that they're getting it because you're disappointed in them. They know mm. deeply. And because you're so important, it's really threatening. And so what are they going to do? The other, the typical response to that, they'll defend themselves or they'll shut down or they'll dissociate or they'll go play an extra round of golf, bury themselves yeah. in work. Right. And, and by the way, that's, that makes a logical sense. That's a logical thing to do when it looks like I'm being told I'm bad. Right. It's, it, 
So, so, yeah, so that's the typical 80% of the time, one person I'm hurting. So I'll give you some feedback gets together with the other person that they're hurting because they heard the feedback and they, they pull away or defend themselves. And then they mm-hmm. do that on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And exactly. On, till, right. Till they find some sort of intervention resolution or which I would imagine like when you're stuck in that cycle over and over again, then you get to that place of contempt and disconnection, which I find like what's interesting at what you said is we don't, we're not inspired to get better at relationship when our relationships are working right. generally. Yeah. Right. Like I think a very small, maybe 0.1% of people. And I think even people who are interested in personal growth right. will actually repetitively seek expansive knowledge. It's usually the frictions that we experience that then go to information sourcing to try to move through what's what frictions we have that's if we're orienting to friction from a place of it's an opportunity exactly so how does someone get like how do you navigate or help someone orient differently from the place of here's the solutions i'm dressing up in nonviolent communication yeah and i laugh because like when my wife or i start even though we like are very well versed in how to use the language yeah. the moment she says something like hey i just need to clear something with you or hey do you have a moment i'd just like to share something even though it might be positive mm-hmm. before the positivity rolls i'm already like here we go right you know or, <laughs> your organism is ready right it's, like, it's ready yeah that's great. Oh, man. It's great you notice, right? Well, well so let, let me, there's three main pillars, right, of the work yeah. that I do, right? The yeah, first perfect. is attachment theory. And it's very important the way one learns attachment theory and the way one uses atta- that knowledge of attachment theory. So I'll get into that, hopefully. Yeah. The second yeah, no, is just it. systems theory, and they go hand in hand, right? Perfect. And then the third one is like, I, everything we only change through experience, right? Like, look, I like talking. You and I are chatting. I'm gonna give. We're gonna share some information. It's a great doorway, but at some point, we have to have transformational, living, breathing experiences, right? And so, so there are yeah. the three, right? Attachment theory, systems theory, and then we have to have transformational experiences. Awesome. Well, let's let's dive in then, Great. like right into. So you said there's a difference. There's a recognition of attachment theory, and then the application. So yeah. yeah, and the importance of the application. So maybe just to update people who maybe have not heard of it, exactly. or yeah, um, I think anytime we learn it, there's a different iteration that gives more language. That's great. So please. In speaking to a lot of people, I get the sense that a lot of us are feeling disconnected from ourselves and we're finding ourselves dysregulated given everything we've been through the last two, three years and what's going on in the world today. Now, the problem is that too often we try to numb it out by watching things like Netflix, scrolling social media, and there's so many other addictive vices. And for me, sugar used to be my numbing agent of choice, but certainly social media can be up there too. But there is a way to heal and deal with the inevitable stress of modern life. You know, personally, I've been regulating my nervous system in just five minutes every day with a breathwork practice from Open. Now, when I incorporate a breathwork practice in the morning or before an important call or podcast recording, it helps me clear my mind and get present with my body, my thoughts, and my emotions, which in turn helps me show up as the best father, husband, and leader I can possibly be. I've been studying the connection between our well-being and the nervous system for years now, and our nervous system can become dysregulated simply by scrolling dating apps or social media, interacting with others who are dysregulated, or even just by life's daily challenges. So enter Breathwork. Breathwork is an awesome tool that helps me regulate my autonomic nervous system and manage anxiety, feel more in control, and ultimately feel less stressed. It has so many benefits for your mental, emotional, and relational well-being. In fact, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who I love, did a study in 2023 through Stanford and found that five minutes of breathwork outperformed meditation for improving mood, autonomic regulation, and lowering stress. The reason I love the Open app is because it makes it easy to add a breathwork practice into your routine with their library of guided sessions. So when we regain control of our operating system, we can count on better days with less stress, more energy and vibrancy, and being more present in our relationships, as well as feeling more in alignment with our best selves, among obviously many other health benefits. And who doesn't want that? 
So come thrive with me and unlock your best self on Open. You get 30 days free by visiting withopen.com slash create the love. Again, that's 30 days free by visiting w-i-t-h-o-p-e-n.com slash create the love. Yeah, no, thank you. And, I, you know, and I try and do it. I, the way I do it is um, just very simple, in my opinion, logical, right? Like from the moment you were born, your first need was not food and shelter, right? And we, we, everybody knows this intuitively, right? You had to have a good enough other on the other side of your birth or you would die. So right. like you could have been in the securest, warmest room in the world with a big stack of food beside you and a, you know, a Netflix subscription, Amazon Prime subscription, and you would still die if there wasn't another person there that was going to be there for you emotionally and you were going to be good enough for them. Right. They're the two key, yep. right? That they're going to physically and emotionally be there for you and you're going to be good enough for them. Now you've grown up, right? You're no longer a baby and your mother or whoever raised you, fingers crossed, is no longer your primary attachment figure, right? That's a whole other problem. If your mother's still your primary attachment figure and you're a grown up, right? So let's say your current partner or the partner you were just in relationship with is your, it was, was your primary attachment figure. Your organism is going to look out in the world and it's going to be, are they there for me? And am I enough for them? Right. And, and that's that you're always going to feel at, at the deepest level of your being threatened. If there's a hint that the answer to those two questions are no. So this is just the reality of our biology. We're an interdependent species. How we learn to thrive is we would work together. We're born where we can't do anything. The human brain doesn't fully develop till 25. We have to have this bonding mechanism to survive and thrive as a species. So it's just biology, right? Love is literally biology, right? Just like you needed your mom, right? Whoever raised you, you need your partner on a cellular level, or you're going to feel really threatened. Okay. So that's just attachment. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. That's the most, at uh, the most basic level, right? Now there, there are two sides of wounding, like primarily there are these two sides of wounding in love, right? I am scared you won't be there for me. Right. And that would be what's called anxiously attached. I get scared you won't be there. And then the other on the other side of it, on the other side of it, there is I am scared that I'm going to be rejected by you because you're disappointed in me. Mm. And so so I'm not enough. Yeah. And I'm scared that you might reject. You my leave me. Well, sorry, yeah. the, on the one side is I'm not special to you, I'm not important to you, you don't want me, I, I, I'm not your priority, you're going to leave me. So that's like the anxiously attached. And on the rejection yeah. side on the is I'm not good enough, I'm always failing, no matter what I do, you're disappointed, I'm not acceptable. And so just think again from an evolutionary biology perspective, yes, when you were born, you needed your mom to be there or a dingo could have come and eaten you, right? You had to have someone right. be there physically and emotionally. They wanted to be there for you. But then let's say they were physically there, but you're two years old and your mom is looking at you going, oh, my God, this guy, look at him with his dirty butt. Like, ugh. <laughs> that, that child, it, because they're so disappointing, is at risk of being eaten by a dingo, too. So there is an there's an awareness of their existence, but their existence may not feel celebrated. It's yeah, it's yes, I, I, at the very least, not celebrated, and the child gets it that I'm a disappointment. Yeah, yeah. Now those two people get together. How the universe works, the the trick of God, the trick of the universe. The exactly. Of, well, and we'll there's a reason. Yeah. I don't know how much how deep we want to get into this, but there's a reason why those two people get together, right? But so here's how then so this is then systems theory plays out. So let's say that's all true, right? We were interdependent species, we have this biological bonding mechanism so that we could thrive, right? Um we need to keep the connection with our primary person or else we're facing an existential threat. So that's just hardwired into who we are physiologically. Now you grow up. You go date, you go to a nightclub, you see someone across the room and they do the best, like, you know, moonwalk you've ever seen. 
And then so you respond with dude and the worm and you both look at each other and you're like, we were made for each other. Right. (laughs) And and you have an amazing six month honeymoon, right? Where you're like practicing new dance moves together and you're just so happy and excited. But then six months and one day later, you're driving in the car together and one of you says something. Hey, you know what I was just thinking about that was really fun. And the other person's having a daydream looking at the window. And the person that's like anxiously attached, are you there for me? They go, wait, w- were you not listening? And the person that like is like deep down inside their fear of being rejected for not being enough. Hey, listen, it was just a daydream. I'm here. Like, is everything OK? Well, I, I thought you said you'd always be here. Oh, I-, I thought you said I'd always be acceptable to you. And now now we're off. Now we're each other's primary person, but that means we're looking to be that one that like, are you really here? Am I really enough for you? Now the games have begun, right? The real love big games. Have <laughs> now begun. it's really on. It's, now on, it's on, right? But that's the thing. But most people experience that. Like you say, is it an opportunity or is it like, oh, this isn't the right person for me? Mm-hmm. right see mm-hmm. they're not here the way they were supposed to be and i'm a queen and i have a right for my needs to be met and the other person is hey i should be respected and accepted for who i am right like you know people have been fed these ideas yeah. that this pain can be misinterpreted as and then they start to look at each other as hmm are you really here which of course makes the other person feel even more rejected and so now mm-hmm. they're going to be more defensive they'll pull away The more they pull away, it makes the person that's anxiously attached even more scared you're not here. So they'll give them some more value added feedback, how they could be a better partner, which will make the person that is avoidantly attached. I'm actually scared I'm going to be rejected. I actually might like, look, I will give you a hug, but do you mind if I give you a hug tomorrow? Because giving you a hug today (laughs) is too scary, right? So then this is like systems theory. Right. So when I'm hurting, I give like I'm I'm scared that you're not here. So I give you feedback. It makes the other person scared they're being rejected. So they pull away, which are, oh, it keeps More the feedback. positive feedback yeah. loop. See, you really are not here. I have now I just got even further information. I should give you some more incredible value through my wisdom about how you could be a better partner. Oh. This is even more threatening. I got more feedback. I should definitely go on that extra long weekend with the boys. Right. And so they keep reaffirming each other's worst stories about each other. And it's terribly tragic because it's only happening because they love each other so much that they're both getting scared. So fascinating. Like the old strategies keep being used because they're unfamiliar or because they're familiar, because they're unconscious, because we're not knowing that this thing is bringing up this internalized belief we have about ourselves, which I think of the gift of that now. I didn't know it was a gift before, right. but the gift of having someone mirror to you an unconscious belief that you have not confronted, that your mother wasn't present or your father, or they were too present or they were there, but not there. Like all this experience of unprocessed, uh, unreliability that then creates a story of how we orient to the world and its reliability and our value, which is, I love that perspective that yeah. it's both, is this predictable and reliable? And what, what did it mean about my worth? Right. I, well, absolutely. And you, you get to, you're touching on at, at the deepest end, right? If you think like wounding and love, there's three main factors of wounding and love, right? And, and you're really touching on the deepest part of it. Um, so the, the three main factors of wounding and love, right? Is there's an unmet love need that the person's sensitive to, right? Am I special to you? Are you like, are you there for me? Are we a team? Am I enough for you? Right. And then there's a vulnerable feeling that accompanies not getting that love. So th- those two things are really painful. I'm sad. I'm scared. Right. It, you know, I, you know, and, but then deep, deep down inside, and this is often the hardest thing for someone to get in touch with is it mm-hmm. touches my unworthiness. Cause you know, mm-hmm. a kid, if you're not being loved by your parents, your parent is God. Your parent is right. perfect. The kid interprets it like it's, there's something wrong with me. And so like, again, this is just a rough guide. The anxiously attached person at the deepest, deepest level ends up in unworthiness of too muchness. 
and yeah. the avoidantly attached one that I'm scared of being rejected, I'm always failing to measure up, they end up in the not enoughness, right? So, so let, let's just so I don't like we keep some track, right? The attachment theory, we all need to be emotionally bonded from the cradle to the grave. It is what it is. It's how we're built right? right? as yeah. mammals, right? All mammals, right? And then the second one, the second one is systems theory. When I'm threatened and hurting in love, what I do to protest hurting, it actually threatens the other person. It actually confirms now that they're not being loved the way they long to be. And then they respond and protest, which now confirms for me I was right. I am threatened, so I better give more, you know, of my, the way I protest. And they get stuck in that infinity loop over and over again. So that's the systems theory. Right. And then the experiential part is what I do. Right. And so this is where we mush those two things together, where now let's say a couple comes to see me. The three of us will be like three scientists together. And our subject of study is the system they're both creating with each other because of the way they're built emotional right. needing this emotional bonding and how they both protest not being bonded and how it hurts each other. And if I can help them. At first, just see the system perspective, right? And then actually grieve and feel the tragedy for the entire system. So if you imagine, you imagine like, like say I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the director of a, of a play and the, my two lead actors are Daniel Day Lewis and Meryl Streep. I, like I got real lucky, right? I've got like, the two, two of the greatest actors of all time. But one of the downsides, though, is Daniel Day-Lewis is so deeply embedded in his character. I'm not feeling loved and I will give feedback. And Meryl Streep is so good at being I'm feeling really rejected. No matter what I do, it's not enough. I ain't talking to Daniel. Right. They're so good at it that I have to go, wait, wait, wait. You guys are missing a really important element. Come over, sit with me in the directorial chair. And see the whole scene. Can you see how heartbreaking this is for both of these characters? Right? My God, poor Daniel and Meryl. This is so sad. They're both trying so hard because they love each other and they get stuck. Like that experience of going, I call it empathy squared. Where it's mm. not just one way empathy, one person's sharing the hurting, the other person gets it and shows them I get it. It's actually we're both hurting at the same time. We're both hurting each other and both people feel that in a living, breathing moment of time. It's the equivalent of going from a two dimensional being to a three dimensional being. That's how big a mind shift it is when you can go from having one way empathy to shared empathy for both of us when we get stuck. So that's the first big emotional transformation experience I'm trying to help a couple have. So to shift to this place where it's not, I have grief and understanding and compassion and empathy for you and your wound and your circumstances and what you've internalized based on your system growing up to, oh my God, I have grief for the way our system moves together, for how our wounds move together, for how the system and us two loving humans who just happen to be dancing with pain right now, the waltz of pain, exactly. as, as you would say, yeah. we, we're we grieving that this is what we've been confronted with mm -hmm. and have. And then how do you then, like, where do you orient from there? Because I'm sure for people listening, they're like, Oh my God, I would desperately want my, par <laughs> again, like, is yeah. this, this is the same person, right? It's like, I desperately want my partner to hear this podcast. I want my partner to mm -hmm. understand that I have grief for both of us. And I wish they would just understand my pain and the grief that the system has. <laughs> like, that's a tough one, right? Like, how do you get someone to orient differently yeah. to their, because if they're like pushing it away, they push the podcast away, the book away, the thought away, the feedback away. They yeah. just see it as part of the same cycle. So without both of them coming to you, how do you even begin to introduce such a thought? And well, what's the next step? Yeah. So, well, so, so firstly, let me say, look, and I love the way your mind works, right? You're clearly, Mark, I love it. Like you're so sharp and you're really following everything. And I know like I can be wordy, right? I get very excited, but here's the, 
just to go the the deepest, most important next step is no yeah. next step, right? Just for a second, right? Let's just say I have a couple together and I will answer your question. What do we do? How do you yeah. get someone yeah. to buy into this? We have to help people live in a world and stay there and not try and get to the next step where we are hurting and we both hurt each other. The first place to get people to connect and bond with each other in we are both sad being disconnected from each other. Most people, their goal, like if you imagine my goal is to connect with you at dinner later tonight, like, you know, right. where we're going to go do, yeah. like redo our dance moves together. Right. I ain't, I don't want to connect with you and our, we're both like, I can't connect with you, can't connect with me. And I see the little kid inside you and you see the little kid in me. <laughs> I love you. I'm like people, that's not a place that people like go, yay, let's work on getting connected <laughs> in the deep sadness we feel. Right. So my job is to get them there and then keep them there and then block all exits. And by the way, the most common exit, what next? Hey, listen, what next? We're, we're here. We're here. <laughs> Let's not go anywhere else. This is it. Right. So helping people realize being connected here and this deep sadness because we need each other. We both got hurt in the past and we're actually healing that deep sadness right now by meeting each other right here. So we don't want to keep them there. Okay. Let me answer your question about what do we do? Like the person's listening to this and go, I'll do that work. I'll do that work. And my partner <laughs> won't, right? Like, sign me up. I'll do it, right? So here's a couple of things. One is a little flippant. You know, my answer is I have a 100% record, right? That no one has ever died in a first session of couples counseling. <laughs> no one zero percent mortality yeah right? exactly we are like everyone's going to get out of line we're talking literal death or <laughs> yeah, um, yeah exactly yeah, literal yeah, death yeah. oh yeah no they're definitely yeah. going to die inside there's right? some like, deaths yeah yeah, yeah there's some deaths there'll be some but death. you will live your heart will beat on you yes. will live right and this you know i always talk about like the the person that the idea of couples canceling is terrible and you get them to one session Right. They'll look like a little spring lamb afterwards. They'll be jumping for joy that they survived. Right. So, so look, you know, my first job, I was a stockbroker. Right. And you, you know, with online marketing. Plot twist. I like it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, as a stockbroker and, um, look, get a small order. Don't ask someone. Here's what, like, let's say the person that's listening to this and they're like, Oh, yeah. 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 I want to do this work. I want to do this work. Usually they go to their partner, go, I listen to this podcast. I think we need to do really deep emotional work, right? <laughs> for months and months. No, that, that person's not going to say yes to that. Like, that's terrifying, right? It's like, I like asking to do weekly root canals, right? Like, <laughs> All right. How All about right. we go to the go, dentist every week? I uh, know it's ridiculous, right? So you want to like just small order, small order. And then, you know, the other thing I learned as a stockbroker, if someone says yes, shut up. Don't, don't describe any more features. Take the check and do not say another word. Any word you say after someone has said yes, there's only downside, right? So you, here's what you want to do. So true. Sales perspective. I agree with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. That's true. That's I know. So I, I was lucky. I got really good sales training as a stockbroker, right? Back in the nineties. I'm, I don't even know. I'm dating myself by, I don't even know, decades. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've so, gone to the place where we don't remember the decade. I know. It's sad. It's, I'm, I'm not far behind you. So. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, one order, one session, right? And shut up if they say yes, right? You'll never have to do it again. Trust someone like me that knows what they're doing. Let me do the convincing that this is a really good idea. And by the way, let's say most likely this is true, not always, that the person listening to this podcast and is going, me, 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 I want to do it. I'll do that, right? They're the anxiously attached one, right? This is the weird, crazy thing that people don't realize. The person that is avoidantly attached actually does better in couples counseling that uh, like they learn faster and they're more comfortable in couples counseling than the anxiously attached one i think i know why but yeah no sure. go on tell if you want to right, i'll tell you but you want to why do you yeah i'm it? curious okay okay i'm gonna take a stab at it I, my guess is because the self-perception of the person who is anxious is that their poop is in a group. Exactly. So when they go to therapy, they think it's going to be oriented around the problem. 
that they've right. been trying to fix for so long. And then the person who is self identifies as being a problem being the poop. Yeah. is like, <laughs> Oh, so I have a way out and I'm not the poop. Like exactly. my worth is being validated and you're going to give me solutions. She exactly avoiding people get thrown under the bus <laughs> in terms of, uh, social media books, right? Uh, the general message, cause the consumer is generally anxious. And then, you know, I, when I do sort of surveys of my audience, about the desire to learn about avoidance. Oh my God, they're, they're in the DMs, they're in the surveys, they're saying like, any more tools? I, I really desperately do want connection and love, right. but I'm afraid I don't know how yeah. to stay with it. I don't know how to be with it. So yeah, is exactly. That I love it, Mark. No, I love, you're really sharp. I love it, I love it, right? Exactly, exactly, right? The person that like I'm alone and I'm the one that's trying arrives in couples counseling. Oh my God, the couples therapist is going to see how just emotionally available I am. And the avoidant <laughs> one is like, is just like, oh, here we go. Like I'm about to discover more details about how crap I am. And, and what I, what, the, what's actually on offer is, Hey, by the way, it's both of you. And it has to be both of you for it to make things better. The journey from I am the shit one, I hope it's okay to curse, to it's both of us. Yeah. Like, that's like, I'm in. I'll go from I'm the right. crap one to it's both of us. <laughs> right, the right. that is like, I'm pretty awesome. Cosmopolitan Magazine told me I'm awesome. There's a whole bunch <laughs> of people that also have diagnosed their partners just like me. And I'm, I'm being like, God bless the people that are hurting, not feeling prioritized. Shit, I used to do that. I totally yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. so but that's a more, that is a harder journey to go. Like you said, the self perception that it's an actually a harder journey for that person to I get agree. to like it's both of us. So here's what I would say. That's what I'm saying. If you got your partner to one session that the message is it's both of us, they're they might be the one. That's like, yeah, I would, I would do that again. Right. So that's <laughs> yeah, a, the person's yeah. like, wait, this wasn't a good idea. I know, exactly. They're yeah. like, hmm, no, no. But, no, but, but the, by the way, usually pretty quickly, the, the, the anxiously attached, I don't even like that expression, right? Um, but that person gets like, oh my God, the therapist, the figs is really helping me. Or I get this person to share with me. This is exactly what I want, right? So, yeah. So it serves both of them. Um, but, but by the way, let me go back to something what I said about the importance of how you use attachment theory. By the way, this is the same with every, any model for self-development you learn. Any method for good can be used as a weapon, right? right. It, it, like Just like nonviolent communication, and by the way, I did this in my life, right? I lived at Esalen. I lived like communicating self responsibly 24 hours a day. And then eventually I real, and then I'd go out back to San Francisco from Esalen and I would meet people out in the world. And honestly, I was just a dick because I was so good at communicating that other people were terrible at communicating. Right. So I had taken this tool for good and just m made it, it totally unconsciously, unintentionally into this. I made myself a complete dickhead. It's interesting. It's like, no, I, I get that, that there's like a form of condescension in the awareness of the language, exactly. which I think we can all fall prey to. It's yeah. like, I read this thing. I basically understand everything now. You're the one who doesn't. Here's a book on nonviolent communication. If right. only you'd read it, you know, exactly. like even a, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And That's attachment interesting. theory is, is the same. And in, in a way it's even worse. If you think about everything I've said, I hope it comes across the whole point of learning attachment theory is to have more love for yourself and the way you're wounding and more love for your partner right. and more love for everyone in the world. The only reason anyone is acting in ways that look like the way they're behaving is not helping them is that's what they're doing to survive the way they're hurting inside. And mm -hmm. attachment theory explains to us how they're really legitimately hurt, validly hurting inside. And they, you deserve so much empathy and compassion. Now you use the way you learn about attachment theory for that purpose. Brilliant. Unfortunately, most of what is written about attachment theory are written by researchers 
and you do a test, you get diagnosed, right? Like I'm anxiously attached, my partner's avoidantly attached. Oh my God, we better make sure we don't end up with someone who is avoidantly attached. And now you've just managed to use this wisdom that actually is beautiful, a way of us understanding and loving humanity as another weapon to use against yourself and other people. Mm, mm. Like more language to create more identity, to create more separation, to create more structure, which I think when we start to identify, you know, I'll hear someone say, I am anxiously attached. And, right. you know, I really like the idea of like, I'm prone to anxious behaviors when right. there's evidence or perceived evidence, because it's not always true of insecurity. So yeah, yeah, it's a, especially because like, I think what we don't get taught because we don't get taught basically anything about relationships, maybe for 0.001% of schools. And like when I have a friend who's like, I grew up and my mom and dad were listening to Wayne Dyer. And I'm like, well, that's not very many people. Right. So you start to get this education about relationship and you start to I think, you know, it's such an essential part to nerd out on because there's so many beautiful yeah. things. You Anyone can learn how to be good at relationship. Yes. Now, our predisposition based on our childhood can obviously set us in a direction where maybe our parents have done this work and they're good at communicating and da 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 But, you know, that's this, this stuff was not available, this level of of knowledge, like what is possible now for relationships, especially you and I, before we hit record, we're talking about parenting. Like now I look and I'm like, I don't want my son to spend the majority of his twenties trying to discover how to undo his childhood, you know, or repair it right. and then have to repair upstream to me because he got the patterns from me. And then now he has to change how he reorients to me and the system has to change. Right. So, you know, imagine if our system just functioned fairly optimally, fairly, and it was open to feedback and adjustments. Right. And then be amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. Our society would be fucking awesome. It, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. L let me, but uh, you know, I know you asked what are some of the things my, I'm most passionate about these days. Um, yeah. One of my soapbox, like, you know, I'm, I'm, pro you can interrupt me is, the so self-development wisdom of today is still based on the gestalt prayer. And there's, so, you know, like back in Big Sur, Esalen, you know, where I used to live, um, we all, and then it infected the whole culture, the whole society, right? Here's what the gestalt prayer is. I get to be me. You get to be you. If me being me and you being you, we get along, great. But if me being me and you being you, we don't get along, it can't be helped. So right. it's just real individualism, self-responsibility. I have binary, my needs yeah. to be met. You can't meet them. We move on, right? And that really has infected our culture. And, of course, in, in America, where I live and I love, let's be clear, Right. I love it. Right. This is in the criticism. Right. We, we have it in our constitution, a radical right to divine uh, individual sovereignty and pursuit of happiness. So the interdependence idea in love, right, that we both actually need each other. And it actually is it's a feature, not a bug that we both get scared and threatened. And it's an opportunity for us to find each other and be there for each other, like, you know, on the other side of our threatenedness. That is counterintuitive, and it is not what is taught by most mm. of the self-development movement today. What is primarily still taught by most of the self-development movement is what is it that you're feeling? What do you need? Go ask for the other person to meet your needs. And if they can't, well, now you have a choice to make, right? ask for it to change, ask again, or leave. This is all old paradigm ideas, right? Without, and all of these ideas came about before attachment theory. And by the way, let's be clear, you know, as Andrew Huberman says, attachment theory is the most solid researched area of all of psychology, 
right? It is a theory, but it is, if you were going to hang your hat on there's one idea of human development that is solid, it is attachment theory, right? So this kind of idea that we should be much more loving and kind to ourselves and our partners and use these like moments of disconnections as, as growth opportunities, like that is again a, a path I would uh, propose to dramatically less suffering for individuals than this idea of I'll work at what I need, ask, and if I don't get it, I'll find another way to ask or leave. So right before I sat down to get some work done this afternoon, I experienced that classic afternoon crash. You know, my energy was dropping and I could feel that my brain was sort of like, eh, are we going to do this? And I don't drink caffeine very often anymore. I don't want to be dependent on it. I might have a coffee once a week. And the reason is I don't want to have to be like, oh, I need a coffee to get through this afternoon. I felt like that was just another form of addiction. And I like my body and my mind to be free from the necessity of things in order to show up and perform. And so one thing that I've done in order to replace coffee and still get energy and also nutrition is I've been taking Organifi Red Juice. It's got 13 superfoods. It's fully organic. It's got no caffeine, just two grams of sugar that come from freeze-dried berries. And so not only does it provide me with energy, but it's actually super delicious and super easy to make. You just in 30 seconds, you just open it up, mix it with some water and drink it down. And as I said, it tastes so great. So if you want to save 20% off Red Juice, this sounds like it'd be a good fit for you if you're trying to kick coffee or whatever, check it out. Go to Organifi.com slash create the love. And that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com slash create the love. Go check it out. You save 20% on all the good stuff. It's interesting because I think when you start to look at the system as being a place for feedback that then invites us to have an opportunity, you know, where we go from seeing um, our partner's reflections to us as a threat to our self-worth or validating of our low self-worth that we're like, holy shit, this person can peer into my challenges, issues. Mm -hmm. And then I now have one of the greatest tools for growth and evolution. Like right. I have a partner who's willing to tell me the truth. Maybe they could work on how they tell me the truth and maybe I could work on how I respond, but also have boundaries around the way it's communicated. But I'm curious, like when you, because I totally agree with you. I think at the ethos of American culture is rugged individualism. And I think that's probably um, in large part due to fighting for liberation from the Commonwealth. And then you have overt collective um which there's no health to overt collectivism either at the cost no, of individual, absolutely. right? So, yes. which I think is really fascinating, the the parallel that holds to romantic relationship, which is if you look at the anxious person, it's like the connection to other matters more to connection to self. The avoidant person tends to orient around self at the cost of a relationship. Mm -hmm. But when I think about what you're saying, what is the line? Because it's like, if you and I are in a romantic relationship and I give, we've, we've started to orient to each other's perceptions as having value. And I say to you, Hey, like, here's a deal breaker for me. You know, I do uh, not want to be in a relationship with someone who has an unhealthy relationship to alcohol right. or um, can't control their anger, <laughs> you know, and now I feel no longer safe or right. I've never felt safe, whatever it is. So like, where is the line and how does someone hear what you're saying? Because my thought is that a lot of people, especially people who are anxious, will go into self-blame and then say like, oh, here I need to, I need to fight harder for this. Hmm. Right. Interesting. So, so like, where's the line? Yeah. So, well, it's a good question. Here's what I would say the process is. In an ideal world, there's a process, right? Yeah, obviously, totally valid. If you didn't want to be with like someone that has got an issue with substance, it doesn't work for me. That's just like it just doesn't work. But but what I would try and do is help that couple delay, separate out the exploring the emotional process that we're in together around the topic of alcohol from the decision of what do we do? So it's almost yeah, like, okay. let's put on the shelf the what do I do? And then let's just say, like, we have a topic, alcohol use in our relationship, right? Yeah. And now let's explore 
what are the vulnerable feelings and difficult thoughts that come up for both of us? And then what is the emotional system, the infinity loop we get into around alcohol? So one person, look, I see you drink. I get scared you're not going to be here. I'm scared you're not present now. Your consciousness is altered. I'm scared you won't be here in the future. It touches deep wounding in me. This is just a reality of how I feel. What can I do to support myself when I feel that way? Right? I could tell you, like I'm telling you now, what could you do to support me? And we're just trying to help you, like the, this person learn deeply what's actually happening for them around what's alcohol the, use. The situation, the, yeah, what, the emotions what, that are exactly. flowing at and the they, basis of it. Yeah, yeah and, and look, most people, they may, you might, look, me, myself, I might go, look, I, I, I know what comes up for me about my, I'm the son of an alcoholic father. I know what comes up for me around alcohol, but always it's good. Can I not, can I answer this question from a place of not knowing? Could I go on a deep dive? What actually is happening for me? Yeah, and could I close off? Yeah. Could I make it a living, breathing experience of getting to know myself with this topic of relationship, my in uh, alcohol in my relationship? And then during we're doing that, the partner is just their job is to really listen and take in what is really happening for this person. Remember, we're not, we're not talking about what are we going to do about it? That's that's a later yeah. discussion. Right now, we're yeah. just being in the truth. What is right now and really being immersed fully in what is. So the other person, can you really hear the other person and let yourself be affected? Then we're going to flip it the other way around. Right. Yeah. And now the person that had just been listening to their partner say, look, alcohol is really scary for me. I'm worried about what it does to you, how you're not here. What's it going to mean in the future? Really valid. Right. What is alcohol? How, how does it what is it like for you to have a partner that that's what comes up for them? That's how they're impacted, which they are your around behavior, your alcohol yeah. use. Mm -hmm. And so let's see if we can really dive into that, because w the problem is when people are trying to problem solve, they miss the meeting. They miss the experience. And if we, if I can help them actually really feel what's happening between them around alcohol, and then we go to, well, what do we do from this deep understanding and empathy and compassion for ourselves and each other? That is the best place to make a decision together. What do we do? Now, I, I don't know what it will be. I don't know what the answer is. But if I can delay them trying to come to the answer and make them have this deep experience of being with what is as individuals and together, I firmly believe they'll come to the most organic, this right decision for them as individuals and as a couple. That's beautiful because what that would do is create more space in the system to hold the experience that's going on before we get into action, which that's I love that because what you said before is like we get into what now, but we don't we don't sit with what is exactly. And so let's say for example, this couple through recognition, the the partner who is wanting the other person to get sober is saying, for me, alcohol is a deal breaker. Like mm -hmm. the solution for me is you quit you go into treatment, you go into AA, you do something like that. And the other person says, yeah, because, you know, I think when a couple brings forward an alcohol issue, which can sometimes be a hypersensitivity from childhood, that's not really an issue, but I'd say there's a lot of dysfunctional relationships with alcohol. So mm -hmm. let's say that this person has the recognition because usually it's just a truth that we've been avoiding. So there's shame associated with it, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff with alcohol. Um, and again, curious your thoughts on all the complexities because yeah, there's right. obviously a lot of complexity to this. Right. So the person goes, you're right. I need to start going to AA. I'm going to quit. This relationship matters to me because you said previously that you've got attachment, you've got systems, and then you've got transformation. Well, and the experiential transformation. And so, right. so I guess this is, this is the key, right? Again, if you, if you notice what I described is we put on the shelf making a decision and then I help them have this deep experience of their own pain, the other person's pain and the pain together yeah. in our relationship in relationship to alcohol. So it's really important that the then what do we do about alcohol is born out of that deep, experience of truly being with myself connection yeah the other person really being with me and and vice versa and we're with each other and we now 
attend to what do we do about alcohol. So the what do we do about alcohol? This is like if we go to look, it doesn't work for me. It's a red flag. Right. Like it's look, even if you're totally right, there's nothing it's going to do to the other person's organism. Then. Right. Right. And close them off. Yeah. But if it's born out of this, we entered into this cathedral. We went to the Vespery or whatever in the back room. We both felt our feelings and shared our feelings. And now we, hey, look, I don't know. I don't know of me the way I'm built emotionally. I can be with someone that has the kind of relationship with alcohol you do. It's not, I'm not, right. this isn't an ultimatum to you. I, I don't know I can do it. It's too, it's too right. activating. It's too scary. And it's like, like, it's so hard to be me being me the way I am to be unacceptable. I, I don't know what they'll do. Right. I do know we have the best chance of it being the a right, most organic, unquote, authentic, yeah. true outcome. If the decision is made through that process. From the connecting, from that deep, from, vulnerable. Yeah, the experience. The feeling Atta place. Yeah, there's attachment. Yeah. It's a reality. We are in a system with each other. We bring our stuff. Oh, my God, look at the way we're hearing each other, understanding each other. What do we do? Oh, yeah, the right? taste of what's possible. Exactly. In that so, and, and so let's say we get to that place and someone is like, hey, explicitly or implicitly, they, my primary relationship is with alcohol. Let's say that was true. Well, now we're in a new moment of what is, and now I'm going to help them be, we're, we start over. Okay. We d deeply dived into what is, and we discovered the person wants to keep their primary relationship with alcohol. Now we do it again. Now we deeply be with what is. So now what's true? What do we do now? Right? Wow, we just beautiful. So yeah. you end up diving into the emotional experience of each one of these realities. Exactly. We're always so the system can hold the truths that exist anyways. Exactly. So I always like, look, people are people are up to their ankles in what is. And what I do is I immerse people like up to their eyeballs in what is. Yeah. And, and trust I that if that. we do that, then we'll organically get to what 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 should happen next. What should be called forward through both people's authentic organic experience with being yeah. with the depth of each other's beings and their own being. That's beautiful. Right. I've not thought about no, that uh that I mean, I've considered that you, you obviously have to let the organic pathway come. And I think a lot of interventionists project what their desire is for that, which I can sense myself wanting to do that. It's like, get them to quit drinking, give them. You exactly. Know. Um, yeah. But by the way, can I, say, oh, sorry. Yeah. can I say one other thing about this? this? This is the other thing, right? Because remember, if everything I said is true about attachment theory and systems theory, you, the partner of someone that's drinking, you're not the best messenger. Like on one level, of course, you're the best messenger. You, I see you're, you're, you know, you're doing body shots on your own. I don't even know how you do it on a Thursday night, right? You, I don't <laughs> think your relationship with alcohol is too, too healthy. So on one hand, you're the best messenger because you see it, right? But on the other hand, if you say anything, it's going to touch their unworthiness, their unacceptableness. Right. They're going to get defensive. They're going to pull away, drink more. So this is where, like, look, have them sit with someone like me. Just think about what I'm going to do. Hey. There's a system you're look, alcohol is an issue. What's the system in your relationship that alcohol is creating? It, it may feel like the person that alcohol is in just a no go, like we're going this long route. When do we get back to alcohol is a no go? Hey, trust me, I'm telling you, I've got your best interests at heart here. I'm trying to get to a place that the two of them are living in the safe world, neutral world. And then when they're both emotionally safe, now we can tackle alcohol. And just imagine me and, and on this topic, an Irish, you know, I've done my fair share of boat races. And I also was a bartender in San Francisco mm -hmm. while um, stockbroker I mean, during the day, bartender at night. That's how wild I was. Right. You've but, got some experience. I have some experience. But come here. I can talk to someone about drinking or whatever the topic is facing the same direction as them with my arm around them. Right. Not they as don't a feel confrontation. Shame. Right. Exactly. You, that you hit it. Once someone feels shamed, we're done. Yeah. They're the, gone. The, the, the organism you said. It yeah, they're gone. Like I, it, look, if someone comes into my office and I've had this, they, I lived in San Francisco, they're like this city with all these Mexicans. 
Now, of course, right, my instincts will be like, hey, lad, what the hell's up with this? Like, that's not inappropriate. Yeah. But that's it. If I say to them, unbelievable, can't walk down the ha- this street to this city with your red hat on. Psst. What kind of liberty is this? Right? Now, I-, I didn't tell them anything I don't think is true. I joined them. And one day, then in the future, I'll be able to go, hey, wh- where do you think this fear comes from in you that you'd be full of so much judgment for other people? Huh. Right. So, yeah, you but, like open the gateway of trust. And, exactly. Um, so the unconscious seeing you in them. Yeah. So yeah. You, that makes sense. Yeah. You yourself given, given feedback. So th- this is the weird thing. I'm not a big fan. I'm sure we could talk at length about this. I'm not a big fan of partners giving each other feedback. Or, or at least, at least, look, if you're going to give your partner feedback, you should assume it's not going to go particularly well for some temporary period <laughs> of time. Right. Um, so, so yeah, look, get a neutral third party that you're confident will not shame your partner for their behavior so that they could stay engaged in a process. Um, so once you start trying to change people's behaviors or you or someone has a notion of what's right, what's the right outcome, again, the, both of your organisms are millions of years old. People can sniff out. Oh, the passive manipulation. Yeah, that's exactly. Oh, that's so, it's so dirty. And both yeah. like the irony, you know, the intention's obviously not dirty. The intention is to get change and to improve a system. It's just right. we're not going about it properly. But the interesting thing is that the hypersensitivity of both sides of that relationship is to the bullshit way we try to manipulate and gain change. You know, like that's one can, and I think on that, we were talking about attachment theory and like the neuroscience of it. I mean, the the nervous system on a very deep level knows what you're sensing before you sense it somatic exactly. you know somatically yeah the you said something earlier that i wanted to come back to that i thought was really interesting and i think for the listener will be uh very insightful and that is you said when someone let's assume that you've grown up and your primary relationship is now with another right yeah. but if it's not if it's still with your mother or whoever, but yeah. let's say likely your mother, that's a problem. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I remember reading um, Robert Glover's book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. He's a psychotherapist or a therapist. And he said, if your partner is in a monogamous relationship with his mother, you'll never be his priority. Like right. he'll never be able to hold a monogamous relationship with you. Right. And I thought that's really interesting. Like when we're in mesh, and that could be any gender with their mother. Um, or their father, but usually it happens with mm-hmm. mother. Mm-hmm. So w- w- can you speak more to what you meant by that and how we even begin to create space in that? Like, how do we know we're in a, that kind of primary relationship with our mom? Well, so it's interesting. I, look, I don't see it happen too often, but there is a context I see. Well, I, I shouldn't say I don't see it happen too often. You know, most of my work today, like I see, you know, people in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, right? Like the who's who of Silicon Valley to the middle level program, uh, computer people, right? Whatever. Right. So yeah, I often see people of uh, East Indian, like, uh, heritage and literally right. emigrated from India. It is not uncommon that the primary relationship is with mother and then they're married. And their spouse is really not impressed. But now we have it. It's complicated because there's, look, here are my, you know, Western therapists bringing Western existential psychotherapy. And then oddly mixed with, you know, East <laughs> Indian, so like, yeah. you know, philo- philosophy. And then, but, so here's what we're going to do. Again, the beauty is I'm not going to try and change anything. We're going to cr- name the system. Right. It like so attachment is real. So you're you're let's say the guy is look, mother is still my primary responsibility to make sure mother is happy. But I have a wife that's looking to me the whole time, looking out like, are you there for me? Am I your priority? So they're distressed, not particularly surprising. They protest and they're unhappy with mm-hmm. you. So now you feel okay. terrible. You're disappointed in them for not accepting you. And so you double down on confirming for them that, look, it's my mother. How could you not? 
So now they like, so I'm just going to bring them even more deeply, more fully into, oh my God, this is terrible. And, and look, I'll, I'll get, let them decide themselves. Like this is a Western idea would be, we got to prioritize this family now. Right. But, but again, like, you know, ha- you know, you see, I do this gesture with my hands up. Yeah. Right. Hey, I, I, you don't like, it's like, you don't have to, but there is going to be ongoing attachment, emotional bonding, suffering. If your primary person who you're trying to be there is someone other than your spouse or life partner, like it's not realistic. It's actually kind of crazy to expect your partner to be okay, that your primary relationship is your job, your Olympic training, your um, alcohol use, your buddies, your mother, it, it, like whoever the third party, it doesn't matter what the third party is, you, it, you're kind of out to lunch if you think your life partner is going to be okay, but you really have a primary relationship with someone other than them or a competing attachment interest. They're not going to be okay, right? It's too distressing. Right. Makes sense. I would imagine, you know, the reply to that, let's say from like a professional athlete or like an Olympian or um, or even someone who's in this enmeshed relationship with their mother, you know, would be, well, you knew what you were getting into, which that's not inviting the system much curiosity, but what do you think of Well, but that, but let's differentiate, right? Again... Remember, there's, there's, let's say for simplicity, there's two different places. One is I'm in the, the only reason someone says you knew what you're getting into is because being with what is was so overwhelming. They moved into a strategy to get away from it. You knew what you're getting into is a strategy to get away from the powerlessness and helplessness of what's coming up for the other person. So I'm going to bring <laughs> totally. them back to the powerlessness and the helplessness. See, I'm not going to buy into, Oh, you knew what you got into. I'm not going to buy into that. That that's, that's just a reaction because they're so overwhelmed by my partner's distress it's a total misunderstanding. What the reason they say you knew what you got into is they love their partner so much they couldn't handle the distress they're telling them they're feeling. Uh, right. So yeah, it's like so. But what? How sad if someone hears you knew what you got into and then they go, "Well, what's that like to hear?" They missed it. They love them so much they weren't able to tolerate the pain that they're in. Right. Of that reflection of that experience of their partner. Yeah. That's why this, the only reason anyone ever says you knew you knew who I was is there. It's that's just the response to the like. It's so painful that my partner's disappointed in me. Now, by the way, let's take the Olympic athlete, you know, and I've had these situations, right? Or the you know the tech tycoon. Look, what we might need to get to is grieve and accept. Like, look, I my partner does have a competing interest. And it is going to be hard for both of us. But let's then at least have both people. Look, I'll, I'll always be like, I, I choose to be here and be with you. And it'll always, there'll always be moments my heart's breaking because you're getting up and running at four in the morning instead of snuggling with me in bed. And the person that's getting up and putting their sneakers on, they reach out infused with this experience and acceptance. I, they put their hand on their partner's leg while they're still sleeping and squeeze it going. I hate that I'm disappointing you and it makes sense that you're hurting and I'm going to go run now. That's a very different world than a couple that are still fighting what is. Right. They're, they can decide we're yeah. going to be together and we, it will be hard. This aspect is going to be hard for us. And, but, and they could meet that together. And just think about what the hug is like after winning the gold medal. Look what we went through together, right? The pain that we accepted in our relationship and we made it our pain. And so this is our gold medal, right? On the Olympics, yeah. like podium. Yeah. And I'm sure for some people that's, you know, we have to get clear through that process that you're talking about that for some people that won't work and for other people it will. You know, and that's and beautiful. And that's so, so look what the way I say, I bring people to the threshold of revelation from angels of America. We're going to bring people to the threshold of revelation. I don't know what they'll decide there. Right. 
I love that you're detached from the outcome, which I think so many people have a problem with, as I said right. earlier, it's like by doing that, you're allowing the organic outcome to exactly. present itself because you're not biased in the way that you ask questions, influence, right? Because I think so right. many people do be it through their paradigm of their biases and they don't even know that they're doing it, but they know what they would prefer. So then they project on to the people what they prefer. And then inevitably those people inauthentically maybe end up there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And by the way, so this is, look, when I train therapists, this is the thing that the therapists, you, they tell you, like, they get so tired of me because I won't stop on this. You Like our job as therapists, this, ty this particular type of therapy, find the places that you cannot see how other people make sense and do the work to get to they make sense. you got to be able to see everybody else make sense always, right? always right the only reason they're acting the way they do is they're threatened inside the way they act the way they do threatens other people no wonder they get more of the response from the world that threatens them you always got to be able to put that together right everybody always makes sense now i love that um, it, and the, the other thing if i can on this i love the way gaber mate says this very simply i do not try and help people feel better i help people feel their feelings better and through the process of helping people feel their feelings better, weirdly, they end up feeling better. But I almost have to whisper the last part, just like meditation. You'd, if you're meditating to get enlightened, you're not going to get enlightened, right? But weirdly, you might get enlightened if you just meditate, right? But, you know, but, so <laughs> it like, yeah, if we can get people to these deep, deep experience of self and each other, they'll work things out. Yeah, I agree. And I'm I'm curious for the people who are single. Yeah. Like what do you think is at the root of all relational problems and and how do people knowing that how do people keep that in mind when they start new relationships? Well, so again, so the most important thing are these two attachment and systems theory, right? Like, you know, like you know need, them, immerse yourself. Well, just know them. And I wouldn't say, yeah, it's not the theory itself. When I, you know, we say the word theory, it's like people are going to read about it is know yourself and know mm. what you co-create with other people. So here's like, look, if you've been in a relationship and it ended, there are three things you could study. You could focus your attention on, right? One is what was the way the other person was useless at relationship, right? That people love to study that. <laughs> They'll love right? that one. They're exactly. like, oh, fuck, I got a list. Yeah. And, and this so, is my favorite exercise ever. Wait, I, question two. I, I know, exactly. And so this is why I always say, like, look, you already have a postdoctorate level of education on the problems of your ex. So just give yourself a round of applause. Don't study it anymore. Right. This, the <laughs> second thing you could study that would be really good. What is it that happens in me in relationship? What are my unmet love needs? What's the vulnerable feelings? What's my my self worth challenge? Too muchness, not enoughness. And then how do I respond to protect myself, even if it's logical to me? Am I an advice giver, a shutter downer, a dissociator? Like, what's the negative perception I have on other people, right? What's the reactive emotions I have? Learn about yourself, right? And then be able to notice when I'm in reactivity and reverse engineer down to the unmet love need, the vulnerable feeling, and the unworthiness. And then share that with the world instead of your reactivity. So do that work. Then the third, the third of the options and another really good thing to do, study the system that you and your ex co-created together. Become an expert on the system because look, they had that too. They had an unmet love need, a vulnerable emotion, a self worth thing. They had a way they protect themselves. They had a negative view of you and a reactive emotion. What, how did we combine those 12 elements to create a system that fell apart? So the next mm. time you're in relationship, then you can go into it. As a, you know, an expert on, oh my God, I know what my love vulnerabilities are, the way I hurt, the way I react, the impact I have on other people, the kind of behaviors I draw out of other people and the way it hurts yeah, even one. more. So you do that work. And this is like, you know, like if you want to draw, let's say your partner was a five out of 10 emotional, like, evolvedness, let's call it that, right? If you want to draw an eight out of 10 emotionally evolved partner, make yourself an eight out of 10. Right. Right. I you like do that. the work. 
I like that level of self responsibility. That's like, hey, if you want to create it, be it. Exactly. Because you're the ha- active part of the system. So if the system's not functioning, there's a part of you that's not operating in the system to the way that you want to create, exactly. which again just gives us more feedback from the system on how we can change to help orient the system differently. Exactly. Fix, this is like, you're a magician. I love it. <laughs> I love the language you uh, use you. for it. Thank I love you. the way you structure it. I love the way you make it simple. I also really love that you bring a level of compassion and pun intended upon your work, empathy, Thank you. that... um I really haven't seen, you know, the level of uh, ju- non-judgment, the level of just allowing the system to trust that the system is going to work its way through the best way it knows to because systems are brilliant and the universe is brilliant. Yeah. And it's always bringing out the best in us if we let it. Um, mm-hmm. And it certainly helps when you have an interventionist who's helping speed up right. evolution. Move us through that cocoon a little faster. Yeah. Uh, figs. Thank you for wow, the work you. that you do and clearly the heart that you put into it. Thank you. And um, where can people find more of you? Well, well thank you. Let, let me just say to, just to like actually model it, not just be telling other people what to do. Look, I'm a little kid. There's a little kid inside me that wasn't seen, wasn't validated. His dad wasn't there, like his mom, like she was busy surviving. So she wasn't going to be mirroring me and like, hey, good job. It's still, I found something that I'm relatively good at, like helping people do this thing. And it really affects me to be seen. Like, I want, like, it really, not just an empty platitude, thank you for acknowledging me. It really touches me really deeply. And it touches a place that is nice, but it also, like, it hurts, right? To be seen and acknowledged, right? Damn, in a good way, right? And mm-hmm. it's, he touches a deep wound. So I just, I really appreciate you um, having me on and enjoying connecting with me and, you know, seeing me, appreciating me. Thank you. As far as where people can see or find me, I always like just empathy with an eye on the end dot com. And all the social oh, media perfect. stuff is empathy with an eye on the end, N O W. It's at empathy now, all the platforms. Perfect. Well, we'll make sure we link it all out because people like simplicity. And uh, yeah. Figs, so much gratitude. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to to do it again, Mark. It's lovely connecting with you. Yeah, I agree. And I think we can dive into more yeah. relational systems again. It's great. And I appreciate you. Yeah.